Firestorm for working with us to put this event on tonight. Um, as Mick men mentioned, my name is Andrea Miller. Um, I use she, her pronouns. Along with Maya Hislop, I am co-founder of Upstate Abolition Project. We're based in Greenville, South Carolina. And I will be in about three weeks new faculty at Florida Atlantic University as assistant professor of social media and digital cultures there. Um, and so we're really excited to be in conversation with Tyler Wall tonight. Tyler is assistant professor of sociology at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. In addition to numerous articles on the politics of racialized state violence and police power, Tyler is the author of Police, a Field Guide, which Mick just showed us and which you can get through Firestorm if you have not yet already done so. Um, Tyler is also the co-editor of the anthology's Violent Order, Essays on the Nature of the Police, which will be forthcoming in spring 2021 with Haymarket, um, which I'm really grateful to be included in as well. Um, and also the anthology Destroy, Build, Secure, Readings on Pacification. Tyler's monograph, Bestial Acts on the Inhumanity of Police, is also forthcoming with the University of Georgia Press soon-ish, I think. Um, and I should say that I've had the opportunity to work and think with Tyler for many, many years now. So I'm just really excited to be in conversation with him here tonight. So without further ado, Tyler, um, let's start with the easy question. What exactly is police power? Where does it come from and what does it do? Okay, well, first thank you, uh, Mick and Firestorm for having me and Andrea tonight. Um, and thanks to Upstate Abolition um, Project. Um, I mean, I think what is police? Uh, this is kind of my key question that I, that I would stress to people that they need to think uh, about, that it seems uh, on the surface to be uh, kind of self-explanatory, uh, like we already know what police is. Uh, but part of the reason in writing Police a Field Guide was um, kind of out of the urge to take what is so familiar, uh, so normalized, and actually try to start thinking about it in a, in a rigorous way. Um, so I think what is police on the surface seems like a really simple question, um, but I think it's actually more complex and it's more multi-layered um, than what we often, you know, ac account for. So I would say, you know, we know what policing is not. It's not necessarily crime fighting. We know the kinds of empirical studies, police spend very little time fighting crime. Uh, and also I would say, you know, this is one of my pet peeves is, police power being conflated with law enforcement. Um, I don't think policing, I don't necessarily think that's a productive way to think about police. Police also, all kinds of empirical studies show, spend very little time of really um, enforcing the law. But what they do enforce is order. Uh, kinda, and, and we know this, uh, even the own court system basically says policing doesn't have to necessarily um, protect individual lives. It's about protecting the larger order. Uh, and we know this also in, in a more micro level, which is policing, police officers intervene in all kinds of non-legal situations or non-crime situations. So they're usually there dealing with, you know, um, micro uh, situations, uh, personal situations where there's no real clear legal problem. And so their, their goal, their mandate is to kind of reestablish order. So that's one, that's one way. And, and we go on and on about this. Um, you know, historically, of course, policing. Um, there's diff this. This gets more complicated in term, and it's more multi-layered here in terms of how we think about police historically. On one hand, I want to say policing is a relatively new uh, institution. We know this, right? And there's all kinds of different ways in order to kind of historicize police, the police institution. We have it emerging uh, with industrial capital in in London in 1829, and then of course. You have uh, the issue with slavery in the United States that predated that. Um, and we police power then is fundamentally about protecting property and, and, and whiteness. And, you know, property is always racialized, especially in the United States, but, but everywhere. Um, but what I, what I think is really important to think about is there's even a longer genealogy of police that we often 
that the that the 1829 British Bobby's story and even the slave patrol um, doesn't necessarily account for. And it's a larger um, uh, understanding of not just the police, but police power. Police power was a was a was a, uh, it's a broad term in in feudalism, and most others have written on this. The police power really meant broad social policy, and so one way to get at meaning broad social policy before there was actually even the police. And this was kind of retained with the collapse of feudalism into kind of capitalist order. Now, I'll, I'll try to make this more grounded. Um, so one way we can get at what, what is police is to, is to think about the term itself. Um, police, P-O-L-I-C-E, P-O-L. If you think about words, I like thinking about words. Um, police is linked to the polis, the city, P-O-L, right? Polis. It's linked to politics. This, and I, here I mean the state kind of the, 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 the very idea of the state, politics being something about governing. And it's linked to policy, a broad social policy, right? And it's linked then also to politeness, to decorum, to the way things are supposed to look, um, how people are supposed to act in a particular way. And, and I think even though that broader understanding of police power that was no way reduced to uniform police and it wasn't reduced to crime fighting, because the police power was, was, it was designed, it was the state uh, apparatus um, that was meant to kind of identify and eradicate various threats to the to good order, right? To good order, quotes there, right? A particular kind of conception of order. And so, and, and this is, is important, I think, because you know, eventually the, the concept of police gets narrowed down into what we think of as the police. But one argument that, that scholars of police power make, um, that the, the mandate of order uh, never left the police. So we come to think of it as crime, as law, but order kind of still, um, you know, is, is kind of the central defining feature of, of the police power, right? And so, so there, there's some implications here for what we need to, for, for how we need to think about police, in my opinion, which is policing can't be easily conflated with law. It belongs more to the state apparatus than law. And we could get into all kinds of debates about, you know, the law and the state are linked, but they're kind of, they're, they're, they have separate kinds of, of logics in some ways too. And policing is much more to that state component. And I always, I always think of the, the line of the Marxist uh, theorist, Nikos Polonsis, where he says, the state always overflows the banks of the law. And this leads to a kind of a crucial point in the book and, and in my general work, which is we get to a view of policing as a prerogative power, a, a prerogative power. And by that, I mean an executive power, a power that belongs more to the state apparatus than what we would think of in liberalism as the rule of law. Right, and this, this, I think, has really important implications for questions of reform that we can get to. But what I mean by prerogative power is that, is that um, the state or the police is an executive power that is essentially meant to be unaccountable to uh, uh, law, the, to, 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 you know, to legal power. It's not even necessarily supposed to be accountable to any type of oversight. That's by its very, very, uh, you know, the, the way it's built into the, the capitalist state. And why I think this is important, and I think I say this a lot, and people sometimes shake their head like, yeah, we know that, and then they go on and they, and I think they, they often then start conflating the police with law and, and, you know, and then start providing certain reforms that don't necessarily account for the very nature of police. That, Policing, if we understand policing as a prerogative power, meaning it can act how it wants, when it wants, however it sees fit, then it leads to really serious questions about how do you reform a power that was never meant to be um, accountable in the first place, right? And so, and then, and then I'll be quiet here on this first question. We, we can go back and forth, Andrea, but, but I think what I'm, what, what I'm trying to say here is that 
if there's a great quote that I can break this down in a very, or a, a phrase that James Baldwin used in his, in his amazing 1966 report from Occupied Territory that I think is required reading for anyone. Um, where, you know, he, he, it, that's also where he says, you know, the police are the hired enemies of the black population. It's a surefire formula for cruelty. He says a, a variety of amazing things in there. But one, thing's, one thing that he said in there that doesn't often get picked up, and it took me several times to read it where I picked up this phrase, is the police have this, what he calls an arrogant autonomy. It's an arrogant autonomy. And I think what he's getting at there is exactly what I'm talking about with prerogative power that by design, the police power is supposed to be autonomous from kind of the field of accountability, right? That it's, and, and we know this in concrete ways in terms of we could also define police through, you know, the monopoly of violence. We know that there's, I would say there's two things that really define policing. One is they have a monopoly on violence or a claim, a claim that's important, a claim to legitimacy, you know, a monopoly of violence, but also discretion. And discretion is important here because discretion is really getting at the heart of the prerogative power of police. Because I, I love telling people this, the courts have refused, what's discretion? It's the ability to decide, to make decisions. But the courts have continually refused to define discretion. And why? And Marcus Dubber points this out, a, a legal theorist, because the courts have basically said to define police discretion is to limit police discretion, to draw a line around policing. And of course, what this does for me is it exposes this prerogative aspect of policing because that also means if, you, if the courts refuse to define discretion, they're really refusing to define what police is. They're, they're refusing to put a boundary around police. And what that means then is policing is this expansive power um, that that it that that all so so in, for instance in a concrete way, the courts say you can't give predetermined rules to police in how to act in any given situations. I mean they're they're pretty clear on this, right? Meaning you can't give them a checklist and say you're going to go into this this building full of people and you can't do these certain things. Why? Because according to the law, the police have to have this like unlimited uh, capacity to handle any situation, however. Um, they, they, they see fit in that situation. That, I don't know if that makes, ma makes sense, right? And so I think, I and mean, we could talk more about the distinction between law and police here in, in terms of what is the relationship between police and law. But, but I, I guess to end this particular kind of question here, I think of policing as a prerogative power that was never meant to be held accountable by law and oversight. It's an arrogant autonomy. And the law allows this to kind of, happen right the law comes in later <laughs> and says hey you acted maybe inappropriately but that never means the law or that doesn't mean that the law gave the police that enormous amount of power in the first place great so i want to kind of circle back to what you started mentioning about the relationship between prerogative power and reform um and so you what you're talking about is this idea of police power as prerogative power. Um, through this, the, the cops are never actually meant to be held accountable by the law or the state, right? So could you talk a little bit more about what this means for the question of reform and you know, if you'd like to reform versus abolition? Well, I mean, I think, I think if you take uh, what I've been saying, at, at least if we accept part, part of it, that there is something about policing that's a prerogative power, then it leads, it makes actually the typical reforms, what abolitionists call the reformist reforms, uh, education, training, community oversight, all of these things, um, to actually be the more pie in the sky solution, right? Because you're constantly trying to reform something that by its very, that the way it's built into the very, that the state apparatus kind of refuses any type of reform. Um, and so I think it leads us automatically to the question of abolition and abolition becomes then much more logical, much, like it, it becomes the natural kind of solution to the problem. Because if, and this is one of liberalism's central tenets, right, which is liberalism is supposed to have things accountable <laughs> to law. But if you, but if you take the idea that liberalism also accepts that the law can't necessarily compel the behavior 
of the population by itself that it needs this prerogative power to step in in security situations and emergency situations, then all of a sudden, um, if we're against uh, unaccountable power, then we have to start really questioning what is the role of, of, of police in society, right? And, and so I, I, you know, I think prerogative power gets at the, I mean, that does raise a question. How do you, how do you reform a, a power that is never meant to be held accountable in the first place? You know, and there's that, the famous phrase of policing the police, you know, um, but, but how, how do you do that? And what I think, um, I think history plays out. Th this is where, you know, we, history kind of shows this to be the case. We could point to all kinds of things about prerogative power in terms of we know that police officers never, hardly ever uh, are charged. Um, we, know, we, we know that. Um, we know that whenever prerogative power steps in violently or coercively in someone's life and the courts, the law comes in after the fact and challenges it, we know that almost across the board, the courts always validate what police do. We know, we, I mean, we, we have, you know, we, we have case after case after case after this. Um, and so if we think of executive power as a prerogative power, and prerogative power is always patriarchal, it's always author, author, authoritative, um, it, it raises questions for reform, but it brings up, I think, the question of abolition is actually important. So what do we have? Why I think this, why I think this is important is this. This is why I keep going back to the question, yes, of what is police and why I'm stuck on this issue for questions of reform. Because if we don't have a really good understanding of the very nature of the thing that we're fighting, all right, if we don't understand, if we some, we start, what happens is we start to think that we can hold it accountable through very typical reform mechanisms, right? So we have the body cameras, uh, we have, you know, education, training, and even community oversight, which we could talk about uh, a little bit more. Um, or, you know, we have different iterations of the prerogative power. We try to make it a little bit less absolutist in its appearance. So we, we call it community policing and we have, we have coffee with a cop to try to build community trust. Um, and so I think what it does is it presents abolition as kind of the, as actually the more practical solution. And, we, and again, I think I got off this point, but history is important here. We've been reforming the police since police were created. I mean, like, honestly, we've been doing that. You know, the story that I would tell my students is this. Even if you accept the 1829, Robert Pill created the police force in London. One, we know they didn't create that just like because they thought it was going to be a good for working class people. It was, it was designed as something to kind of maintain, uh, you know, the dangerous classes. But immediately, what started happening? The police were corrupt, they were inefficient, they had promised to reduce crime, make people safer. People weren't seeing a reduction in crime, they weren't necessarily feeling safer. There was brutality, bribes, all of that. So what did they say? Well, you know what? We have to reform the police. What are the solutions? Education, training, more technology, more kinds of oversight or accountability. And what do we get? The same damn thing um, all the time. There's this thing that I tell my students a lot. I made this up years ago. It's kind of corny, but it gets the point, which is, you know, I call it the five second history of policing, which is corruption, controversy, reform, repeat, corruption, controversy, reform, repeat, right? Back and forth. And we do, you know, I set this up by giving a long extended, you know, lecture or really like a week or two on police history. But you can think of this over and over. Think of just, if we just start the time from the 1960s, same kind of process, right? We know that there's racist policing. Sometimes the police throw their hands up and say, yep, you got me. <laughs> We're racist. We fucked up. You know, things, things are, you know, we haven't been our best selves, so to speak. And of course, social movements, you know, are forcing them to do that as well. You know, calling, calling right, rightfully so for, for to hold the police accountable. And then what's offered, so there's a corruption, there's controversy, and then there's reforms that are offered up. And it's almost always education, training, and technology. And they take the specific form of the area, era in which they're happening in. But that's kind of the standard cycle, the historical cycle of 
of violence. So what do we get out of the 1960s? We get more diversity hires, right? Because they realize that yes, you know, problematically, the police forces are largely white and, and male. So they say, well, let's hire more black officers, Latino officers, women officers, right? Um, and so, and yet here we are today uh, in the same, you know, I think even a worse situation um, with this, and also the same, and I know we will talk about this, but the same reforms are starting to be, you know, rolled out. Um, and I say about reform specifically is reform, you know, believes that you can perfect the police. Just, you know, that's why it's liberalism's like great, you know, it's just like, incremental just change just reform 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 a little bit of education here a little bit of training a little bit of better hiring process but what reform reform is the belief in the perfectibility of police so it ultimately high, high, hangs on to this idea that policing is still fundamentally a noble institution in some ways right that if we can just tweak it it's gonna it's gonna identify problem with us right it's it's never the police that's the problem it's always us it's our and this is why the key words of, of police reform is trust faith right because reform in my view and we write this in the book my me and my co-author david correa reform is really kind of a recodification of state violence it makes the racist state violence more legitimate. And we could get later into debates about, it's not that all reforms are bad, right? We gotta make a distinction between good reforms and bad reforms. Um, but I think this is the way I, I, I think about reform. It's a recodification, a recalibration of state violence. So for instance, community uh, over, oversight boards, they make sense, they, they make sense uh, on, on one level, right? Um, but we've had, an enormous amount of history <laughs> that um, have tried these out, right? I mean, this is one of the, the reforms. Now, early on, the police establishment was terrified of civilian review boards, right? They called them communist and this and that. Then it kind of quickly subsided a little bit more because they started to realize that there's, it's not going to ultimately hold the police accountable, right? Um, and what I would say in, in that example, often what we see is uh, fighting for the community uh, oversight board, and it in some ways legitimates the very thing you're fighting against, right? Meaning now police still get to have that discretionary, arrogant autonomy that James Baldwin talked about to do whatever the hell it wants to do, whenever it wants to do it, and however it wants to do it. But now we have what appears to be some type of accountability measure in place that now is going to kind of subject the police power to some type of law, some type of oversight. And what do we know in the history of civilian review boards? And I'm no expert on this, just a general view, read of, of the history. They almost always side with the police. And even when you fire the police, which I'm in favor of, they still fill the, you know, they, they still put the police right back in the position, right? They hire someone else right back in that position. And it does very little to actually change the structure of policing. And now police can turn to their constituents, to their populace and say, you wanted a civilian review board, look what we gave you. And look, yes, I know you think this killing uh, was unjustified, but look, they've, you know, they've now rubber stamped that everything was, was good here, right? Um, so I think it's important to think of reform, at least the typical reform, as, as actually kind of just entrenching police violence in more and more ways. It's, it's strange. This is why sometimes like police departments are not near as resistant to reforms as what we might think, you know, like not, you know, it's like body cameras are a great example. Early on some resistance, then they realize that body cameras can actually work out in their favor in a lot of ways. And you know, the body camera issue, just to, to highlight the technology component of reform, you know, um, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna solve the police problem through a, a, a technocratic liberalism. You know, of of providing technological solutions for something that is fundamentally about protecting inequality, racialized, racist inequality in society. I mean, that is the function of policing, right? Is is to kind of protect the abstract order of racialized property. Um, and so you're not going to you're not going to technologically fix your way out of of that issue. And I don't think you're going to give more education for officers. Why? Because 
if we take seriously the violence component of policing, one of the things we write in the book is violence isn't just a right of police, it's a condition of police work. Meaning you can't be a police officer without agreeing to be violent and or let your colleagues, your coworkers of violence be violent, right? Like that's part of it. And so that's the mandate that it, how policing is built into our social structure, which means it's not a matter, this is not a matter of educating, giving them more training. It's not a matter of even implicit bias. This is about the state arm or the state apparatus that has this unlimited power to get shit done that it wants to get done. And that is put people in their place, protect some spaces, let other spaces be subject to all kinds of violence or, or, or risk. Um, aim of, you know, security, but, but, uh, so, so reform, I think is, 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 if we take prerogative power seriously, reform is kind of the typical reforms, education, training, um, you know, new hiring practices, this and that does very little to actually change the structure of police. It identifies the problem on us, you know. This is why all these other reforms of like coffee with a cop so important, you know, because it, it really does highlight, I mean, look at the Obama report that came out after Ferguson. It's all about trust and faith. So what do they do? Police are constantly trying to gain legitimacy. By the other day, my kids went, you know, out to the zoo and, you know, there's a cop there in this moment, of course, trying to give them a a collaring book, right? It's because, you know, legitimacy is eroded and they're always doing that kind of thing. Uh, but that's what reform is really about. It's regaining legitimacy. That's where the, the phrase protect and serve came from in the 1950s and 60s. There was a legitimacy crisis of police and they had to come up with the guy's slogan to make everybody start believing back in the police project. So we got protect and serve, right? Yeah, so, okay, you mentioned the legitimacy crisis, and so this dovetails into the next question I wanted to ask you, and I know it's one that you and I have talked a lot about at various points, but in terms of the context of the current uprisings and rebellions, do you think that, the, that policing is in crisis right now? Is this a particularly poignant crisis um, related to legitimacy, or is it just kind of, you know, business as usual, but more people are paying attention, it's more widely recognized? No, I, I think, uh, and I'd love to hear other people's thoughts on this because I mean we're all we're all kind of thinking through that problem, right? Um, I, I mean, I don't think um, I I know of a crisis of policing. I mean, police are always in crisis on one level, right? They like it that way, right? This is the thin blue line, and I know we can talk about, but you know, there's no such thing as like a thick blue line. Police are always scared. They always think that. They need more resources. They always think that there's a war against them. Um, but with that said, this is a this is a moment that we've been in since you know late May at the, with the murder of George Floyd. Um, that I don't know if anyone anticipated, uh, you know, happening. Um, I think they are under a serious uh, legitimacy crisis in ways that I don't know if we've ever seen. Um, and and I you know there's we could all talk about this as a group. But, you know, the, clearly, I think this links up with the pandemic, of course, Trump being in office for three, three and a half years, um, massive growing inequality, of course. Um, but I think policing is under a really serious crisis. And I think, you know, this leads to other questions. And, and I'm, I'll admit I'm not as strong on the abolition defunding question. I, I think, you know, I'm, I mean, I'm interested in that. I know that. But you know, I, I think I'm still stuck on this diagnosing the police, the, the police issue, right? Uh, in order to kind of make our abolitionist politics uh, better or, or, you know, but we're in a serious police crisis and it's both, I think, exciting on, on so many levels. Uh, and yet, you know, it's also frightening, right? Because the, the, the backlash is real. I mean, the, 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 the state doesn't, if, if you take, what many, myself, but many others have said that policing is central to our conceptions of order, that it's absolutely central to conceptions of, you know, or of private property, uh, of, of the white social order. Um, you're not gonna just like call the police into question in a material way, like taking their funds uh, without getting some serious repression back in return, right? 
Um, so I think they're under a serious uh, crisis. I, I, I'll admit, you know, I, I, I'm interested to see if police are able to recuperate themselves um, in, a, in a way um, that they have in the past. It, my, my friend Jared Shanahan had, had an interview in the, the journal Hard Crackers recently where he was saying, you know, what, one way he was thinking about it, and I, I could get this wrong, so I apologize if I do to Jared, but it was all the strategies that have been working in the past about reforming the police and the police being able, kind of being amazing at recuperating their image, regaining legitimacy and trust, seem to not be working in this current, in this current moment. And I think that's, I think that's right in, in many ways. And I think that's also, you know, it's hard to then predict what's gonna happen in the, in the near future or the, you know, far off future. Um, but I do think policing's under serious crisis. One way uh, I've been thinking about this, I don't know if this is, you know, I think Andre, you and I talked about this the other day, but I mentioned it some, to some other people is, there does seem to be, if you just looked at the, at the urban graffiti uh, in the protest that you saw all over the news and, you know, over a hundred cities in the United States, you saw a lot of, of ACAB and FTP together, or, you know, it was like, you know, I mean, one of the top moments I laughed at was like, there's a reporter and it's like the curb down at the very bottom of the curb on the side of the road, it has ACAB and FTP on it, you know? But if you think of ACAB, the phrase, and it's something I've been thinking about lately, you know, it, it grows out of, of England in the 1920s. This was pointed out recently in a vice, by a vice journalist in, in, in Vice, um, obviously. Um, but ACAB, you know, goes back all the way to the 1920s, maybe further. It meant all coppers are bastards because the British bo bobbies were called coppers. And there was an older phrase that it kind of emerged out of, which was all those in authority are bastards. And, and why this is important, I'm getting there, is that, that it comes out of the European context and anti-fascism, and then it really gets picked up in the 1970s uh, with punk music and the anti-fascism that was kind of central to big portions of punk. Uh, and then you have FTP, which comes out of kind of black cultural production, right? In, in the late 1980s um, with NWA's song, Fuck the Police. Uh, but also, you know, in the book we point out in the epilogue, one of the earliest versions of Fuck the Police was Mother Fuck the Police by uh, Marvin Jackman in his poem, Burn, Baby, Burn, that was in response to the 1965 Watts Riot. And then of course today you have F12, which also kind of is an offshoot of hip hop culture in, from FTP. But what I'm, what I'm getting at is if you think about the prevalence, and I think you pointed this out to me, Andrea, of how Antifa has on this, uh, you know, this, it circulates in the, you know, now Trump's identifying it as a terrorist group and this, this and that. There's, in this moment, and that's one of the things people have pointed out, right, is people were blown away at just how massive the protests were of both black and white, uh, you know, people in the streets. And I think you saw this in kind of like the, the, the joint graffiti of ACAB and FTP. Like there's a joining there aesthetically that I think maybe signals a real, um, a more substantial kind of crisis of policing in a certain way, right? It's aesthetic, but I'm saying it points to kind of a material shift. And I've had friends, one of them that I believe is on this call, point out like the Zoomers, you know, just seem to be down with like, they're, they're on to the critique of police and it's not like they're going to be easily swayed by the reform kind of um, project, right? Um, and of course, ACAS has been around a long time and, and TIFA and you know, anti-racist kind of action and things like that have been around a long time. Um, but there does seem to be a conflation in this moment or, or, or a joining of that moment that points to maybe a real uh, cry. And it makes sense, right? It makes sense if you just read the material conditions. I mean, we have, we have more inequality today than we did in the 1960s in terms of economic inequality. Uh, you know, the gap between rich and poor is even more. And so I think there's I think they're in a really a serious crisis. And with that said, as I alluded to, it'll be interesting to see how police kind of, if they are successful in recuperating them, themselves. And I think it's gonna be uneven, right? Geographically, right? What's happening in Minneapolis, which is so inspiring, cool, um, you know, might not happen in all kinds of other places, right? I mean, it's, it's gonna be very, you know, policing itself is decentralized in the US. I think that's one of the key functions or key, uh, 
kind of structures of policing in the U.S. is it's decentralized as opposed into Europe where it's usually centralized. So I think that also makes reforms hard or real challenges to policing as a broad kind of state apparatus that's kind of splintered locally that much more difficult, right? So you can have success in one town, but not have success in the other town. Yeah, so um, I'm gonna actually throw you a bit of a curveball, Tyler, and I'm gonna not, I'm gonna skip a question because okay. I want to stick with this idea of co-optation and recuperation, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think one of the things that's so, of course, incredibly powerful right now is that, you know, um, all of these resounding calls and material moves toward defunding and abolition, which are, of course, owing to the many, many years of work by Black feminists like Ruthie Gilmore, Angela Davis, and Mary Macaba. Um, but I'm wondering, you know, with the mainstreaming of abolitionist politics comes this threat of co-optation by the security state, right? So, you know, even if the institution of the police is dismantled, even if only in these sort of patchwork ways, there, um, you know, that power could simply be redistributed into other areas of the state, right? So could you talk a little bit about this? And then sort of with that, the broader relationship between police power and security itself, right? So like, how should we think about this relationship between police power and this broader sort of sensibility of security? in the context of the kind of current moment in abolition? Yeah, um, I mean, I think obviously that's the, the issue that's going on right now in terms of the, the real question is co-optation of abolition uh, of the, of the uh, you know, the typical reforms or the, or the reformist project is coming in and kind of appealing to people's, uh, you know, there's that thing going around a long time or a few weeks ago about what defunding doesn't mean. I don't know if you saw this, but it's like, you know, defunding doesn't mean really abolish the police, right? And it's like, that was a total kind of like co-optation of the defunding platform, which is like, no. And that's where you started hearing people say jokingly, but seriously, no, I literally mean abolish the police, right? As a way to kind of push back on that liberal co-opting um, uh, of the abolitionist kind of project. Um, but I do think and I, from my read, there's all kinds of people that are well aware of this and, and that are talking about this is, you know, in this moment, because all of a sudden abolition seems like it's on the table on some level. I mean, we got it in the New York Times. People are talking about it. And of course, with that comes its own, you know, problems, right? Does everybody know what abolition, you know, the basic principles behind it? Uh, you know, so you get all these kind of weird contradictions of people saying abolition, but then calling for you know, the carceral state to kind of jump in and intervene in people's lives in coercive ways. Um, but I think there is the question, and this is where we lead back to the first question about the broader conception of police power that I was talking about, the police power's broad social policy. I mean, if you take, for instance, Mark Nicholas's work seriously, uh, and it's, he's in the British context, the fabrication of social order, Versos, getting ready to put out the 20th anniversary of it or something like that. Uh, I would encourage everyone to read it. Um, a lot, a lot of what I'm saying here is coming from, from, from Mark. Um, but if you take the broad conception of police power seriously, it means you can't really think about policing as just the police. That policing is a much broader force. It's a much broader kind of state project for pacifying, um, for identifying threats and eradicating threats. And that can then take the case of... Um, social workers, for instance, right? So, I mean, this is, I think, a real fear right now that what I was alluding to earlier, I think many people are onto this, especially the, 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 the people that you mentioned that have thought about this, right, for, for a long time, that it's not enough to just simply defund the police, get rid of the police, and then use those resources say, for social workers that are still kind of an arm of the state that have you know, it takes different forms than policing in some ways, but it also eerily sometimes resembles it too. And, and they still have an enormous amount of discretionary power. I mean, if you think of it, I mean, if, if Mark was here, he would say discretion, of course, policing is different because uh, it, they have, you know, they have weapons in, in ways that other, institu or other uh, institutional powers don't. But his point about, if you read his, I would encourage you to read the, the, the Fabrication of Social Order, his last chapter, chapter five on discretion is just, I think, just amazing on this. 
because he's making the argument like, look, this is how administrative power works in general. And anybody who's worked at a university knows this. That's why there's all these neoliberal terms like shared government, governments, when everyone knows that's pretty much bullshit, you know, like meaning this, the, the prerogative discretionary power of, of administrators tend to basically do what they want when all, when it all boils down to, you know, uh, the, the final instance, right? We can appeal to people, we can get opinions, but usually executives tend to make executive decisions. We well, there's that popular phrase, executive decisions. That means something, right? Um, and so the point is, we can't think of this. Really, we could think of this as kind of a, a rethinking of of executive kind of power in our lives in order to to determine, you know, our you know how we live our lives, and so. The co-optation, I think, right now, there is a big fear of just simply taking the money and having the state still do what it was going to do, but with a different kind of apparatus with a different look, right? Calling them social workers, they are social workers, and maybe there'll be some positive harm reduction things that might come out of that, right? Maybe a less propensity to use violence in the U.S. content or direct physical kind of killing violence. I don't know. Um, but, but it's a serious problem that we have to think of. That's why we need to think of policing as a much more kind of capacious, uh, broad uh, power, um, um, you know, and, 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 it, and it's challenging because, of course, getting, you know, really challenging the police is going to be, it's, it's proving hard enough, right? I mean, so it's, gonna, it's really hard then to think on your feet and be, okay, we want to get rid of this, but shit, we don't want them putting this in its place. That's that's fighting a lot of battles that are necessary, but it but it's hard. Yeah. So, um, I want to now sort of switch gears a little bit, and I want to okay. kind of step out of your sort of broader work on police power to localize this conversation a little bit more. Okay. Um, you know, one of the reasons I'm really excited, and I know Upstate Abolition is really excited to be in conversation with you is to not only think about police power, but to think about police power in the context of say like upstate South Carolina, Western North Carolina, and just sort of like the South and Appalachia a little bit more broadly. Um, you spent a good portion of your own life now working and thinking in Kentucky, now Tennessee. So could you talk a little bit about what it means to think about police power here? I mean, yeah, I mean, I know you asked this question, and I also, this is the question I kept saying, I, you know, I, I don't know, it seems more like a, a conversation. I mean, I mean, of course, I think there's all kinds of, um, you know, there, there's all kinds of stereotypes about the South and, and, you know, different regions of the South that I think are important uh, and probably thinking about. Um, of course, there's a, there's a long, I think, I mean, I guess what I would say to this is there's a long uh, history of struggles against police violence in Appalachia and, um, you know, the South in general that are multiracial, um, that are, you know, we, we can think of like the labor, mine wars, but, but labor struggles, you know, um, you know, the, the Coal Creek Wars, um, that I that I I wish maybe those those historical moments or that historical uh, uh, you know trajectory or or those historical struggles were were more out in the open in terms of the thinking about contemporary struggles against policing that that you know I mean you know you know this Andrea um, but you know I mean. There's, there's just so much <laughs> because, because one, re one reason is recovering those histories, I think also works against the particular conception that, well, I mean, one, one, I know I'm rambling here, but let me say this. On one hand, we know that Appalachia is not white in the, you know, there's all kinds of black histories here that, that um, are, are important and often get written out of, of, mainstream conceptions of, of the set or of, of Appalachia specifically. Right. Um, and there's, as you know, some people I see on the call have written about, you know, they, they, 
they, this has been made clear in terms of it was a concerted effort in some ways by authorities to paint Appalachia as, as white, this and that. So there's, so there's all kinds of, I think, black histories here that people are trying to uncover that are important. Uh, but there's also, you know, police in Appalachia, in terms of workers and labor, have been a huge violent presence uh, historically in the lives of workers, white and black. And I wish that is what would sometimes be recovered because it, you know, it shows that that policing is not something that that um, affects everyone equally. And there's been all kinds of, of of historical struggles by white people against the police, but those are often kind of left out. And I think that has real political ramifications too, right? And thinking of quote police brutality as just a narrow quote, black issue, right? And there's a great article that I teach in my class, but written some 20 years ago. I was just talking about this the other night by uh, the black legal theorist, uh, Catherine Russell. Um, it's called, What Did I Do to Be So Black and Blue? And one of the things she talks about is, right, one of the ways historically in order to make police violence just a side issue, like where it never gets addressed seriously, is to make it into a quote black issue, right? Because then white society can say, oh, it's just impacting them, right? When when we know police violence impacts all kinds of people, just not equally, right? Just not equally. And so there's something about kind of um, thinking about those histories of labor struggles with the police that kind of is a way for maybe to, to recuperate those or to kind of re, re galvanize those histories in order to put them to use in the present, right? In order to, to realize, um, yeah, they're, you know, he, he's, a, he's a liberal, but you know, there's that comedian, that quote, redneck comedian, Trey Crowder. Uh, I don't know if you've seen him, you know, he, he, I think he's from here in Knoxville. But years ago, in, in the heights of Black Lives, the first kind of resurgence of Black Lives Matter, you know, uh, and he, he's, he's a good liberal, um, and, you know, but he, he uh, had this video that he posted online where he was talking to fellow white people, and he was like, when did you all start liking the police, you know, because he pointed to, like, the history of moonshine and, like, poor white people fighting the cops uh, for years around moonshine, and, you know, he even made, I think he made a joke about, like, that's where NASCAR even comes from, like, NASCAR came as a fight against the cops in some ways. Uh, and so I, I think those histories need to be kind of recovered and kind of talked about in order to kind of create maybe uh, various kind of political solidarities that are important. Yeah, and I think that you and I have talked about this variously. You know, one of the things I always like to think about, even in terms of Blair Mountain, is that one of the first things they did at the Battle of Blair Mountain in West Virginia was to desegregate the dining halls, right? And then there yeah. is the significance that I know that we've sort of talked about a little bit, the, you know, the co- like temporally coincidental nature of like what happened in Tulsa and what happened at Blair Mountain too, right? So it's not, it's not a coincidence that these things are happening at the same time. And I think that they're, you're right, they are really significant to these regional histories and trying to think about police power here. Um, I, so I think we're coming up on nine o'clock. So maybe this is, and I know that I saw um, Bill McClanahan and Judith Shepard in here. So I know they also work on Appalachia and policing. Um, so I think um, what we'll do now, um, thank you, Tyler, so much for having this conversation. Um, I am really grateful to have you here. And I think we'll um, sort of switch gears now over to Mick, who is going to facilitate a discussion and Q&A. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And thanks so much, Tyler. That was really Great information, um, and I'm excited to hear uh, if folks have questions or comments to share in response to some of what Tyler had to share. So I think the way that I'll go about um, running this uh, portion, this Q&A portion, um, is to really utilize the chat function. Um, so I think uh, I'll give two options. Um, one option would be if you don't uh, want to speak um, and you don't want to like have yourself unmuted and you just want to type your question in the chat, um, you can go ahead and do that and I will read the question out loud. Um, but if you did um, want to ask Tyler or Andrea a question directly, um, I do have the ability to unmute folks. Um, so if you want to utilize the chat and just drop an asterisk 
Um, so like I just did, if you just wanna post that there at the bottom, um, I will keep track, I'll, I'll essentially keep stack of, of who has commented that they'd like to ask a question or make a comment, um, and we can do it that way. So at this point, yeah, the, it is opened. Um, cool, and I'm seeing a question immediately here from Jim. It looks like they typed it in, so I'll go ahead and read it. Um, it says, Thanks for the bibliography. Um, I'd like to hear from anyone thoughts on how the new prosecutor DA movement fits in with Tyler's views on police power. Is it enabling like police reform or is it transformative? Also, what about citizen review boards that review police power and that, that review police power abuses? Are they useful or not? And yeah, I don't know, maybe Tyler, if you wanna just like take us off there and we can see if anybody else has a comment. Yeah, I mean, on the, I mean, I, you know, I, I kind of already hit the citizen review boards. I, I don't find them them um, useful. Um, I, like I, I think they're more problematic than, than helpful. They kind of legitimate the police. Um, but, you know, I, I mean, I'm open to thinking that maybe there's some kind of power that could, you know, uh, hold the police uh, accountable on some level, right? Reduce harm, but in general, no, I think the whole history of citizen review boards are, are just kind of show that, right? The history just shows like, okay, can we give up on these already? Um, but on the, on the, on the uh, DA thing, I mean, that's tough. I mean, I, I mean, in, in my, I would love to hear other people's thoughts on this, but I mean, prosecutors are the top cop, you know, there's a reason why Kamala Harris was, was, uh, um, bashed by abolitionists and, you know, other uh, le lefties uh, in terms of, you know, Kamala the cop. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, she, prosecutors have an enormous amount of power uh, that are, that is a police power um, in, in that broad conception that we were talking about. Um, you know, yeah, I, I know what's going on in San Francisco and, and I, you know, there, there's a really progressive uh, prosecutor out there. I know the one, Larry Krasner in, in um, Philly. Um, but I'm, I'm skeptical in terms of, you know, may, maybe, I think maybe for harm reduction, and I think that's important, right? I mean, people are suffering uh, that, you know, maybe you have a, a prosecutor that can come in and kind of incrementally kind of change some policies that, you know, don't negatively or as negatively impact the lives of the poor and, and you know, but, but in general, I, I struggle with the, the, you still seem to have to be working with the police a lot. I mean, we know this, right, through tons of research, the police and prosecutors work hand in hand. I mean, they're kind of the, that's, that's why defendants really are, you know, not, that don't favor very well because the police and prosecutor are kind of one branch in some ways, right? They, they work directly together. Um, I don't know enough about the on the ground details. I'm sure if there's someone say in Philly or, or um, San Francisco that could speak more to what's going on. I, my read of the Philly situation, and, my, and maybe I'm wrong, but Krasner was one of the first kind of to do this, you know, to kind of really, you know, uh, that, that was supported by a lot of, uh, of, of, you know, good people in terms of on, on, the, on the abolitionist side or the, the left. Um, but I think there's been, from my understanding, there's been kind of scattered results there, right? Some good, decent reforms, but also, um, you know, like I think recently, right, he refused to to consider, I could be wrong on this. I know this is being recorded, so I, I get nervous about this, but I think he he uh, refused to, like, look at the Mumia Abu Jamal case, or, he, you know, he did some, he, you know, and, you know, he got major flack for that, and for good reason. <laughs> um, so I don't know. I mean, what, what do other people think? Uh, I mean, but I, I, in general, I think police prosecutors are, are they're police, <laughs> you know. Yeah, any other thoughts uh, from anyone on the call about that specific topic? Surely someone has to chime in. Hmm? I mean, there, there is a good document. I, I don't know if we could find it and put it in the chat or but I remember, oh, I, I saved it somewhere, but there was a good document that went around by, I can't remember the abolitionists that put it together that were really kind of looking at 
it, it was like a, you know, a, a, a workbook, uh, you know, kind of program to kind of say, Hey, this is what prosecutors are. <laughs> they are kind of the, 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 the top cop. And so let's be very careful about how, how we think about this. We can't be, you know, thinking too positively about, and we can't be putting all of our resources and energy into trying to get progressive prosecutors in thinking that that's going to, you know, I mean, my, my general thought on it, and I'd say this is, you know, I always tell my students, like, in general, all we know is, like, individuals uh, don't really tend to change organizations. Organizations change individuals, right? I always tell my students that who often they want to be a cop. It's like, you know, you know, you, we can have all these great ideas that we're going to get in the position and, and, and change the organization, but usually what happens is we find that that organization is a beast of its own that has an enormous amount of power in order to change over how you think, how you operate, because there's constraints on you, no matter your, no matter how well your intentions are, your politics, you, you're still going to have to be tasked with carrying out all kinds of violence. Um, and so uh, that's a problem, I think. And I will say, I, I can't speak to this issue that much either, but I do know that um, the legal scholar Amna Akbar has written about this pretty extensively. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I, I tend to be of, uh, of a mind with you, Tyler, about the, you know, political possibility of this sort of movement. But it is something that's being really, really seriously considered from an abolitionist perspective. And I think that Akbar is the person that's really doing that. So if that's something you're interested in, I would definitely check out um, their work. Um, and they're looking particularly at stuff in New York City. So I can put um, their information in the chat to all find that. Yep. Well, great, yeah. And just to remind folks, you can uh, type a question in the chat box and I'll read it out, or you can drop an asterisk, uh, a little star in the chat box as well. Um, and I can unmute your microphone. Uh, to ask a question. Um, in the absence of that right now, I, I can go ahead and put myself on stack. I'm curious to ask uh, Tyler, um, in, in this moment where sort of abolition is uh, possibly in the public consciousness in a way it's never been before, um, curious to ask you as somebody who has clearly like studied and um, written about this topic, have you always been an abolitionist? Have abolitionist? Like, have you, uh, and if, if not, then what were some uh, sort of like significant turning points or things that you heard to sort of uh, shift your perspective that you think could potentially be useful in conversation with folks that we know in our lives who might have questions about this or might be new to that concept? Yeah, no, no. Um, I mean, I, I think I came to it maybe 10, 10 years ago. Um, and largely, I know he's on the call. I don't know if he's listening. I know he's handling kids, but one of my best friends, Judah Shipp, um, who wrote an amazing book uh, everyone should look at uh, on progressive punishment on uh, jails and, and, and it's in the Midwest. Um, but largely, uh, I was writing on, on state violence. Um, and I was kind of, you know, trying to kind of start to articulate my own politics and where I, where I stood. I come from a rural Indiana background. I was not around activists or organizing or really anything left at all, to be honest, growing up. Um, you know, the university did kind of change me, you know, over, over the years, uh, got me turned on to different things. So I kind of came to it through that. But to be honest, I was interested in war and violence, uh, state violence, and that was kind of what my dissertation was on back in, I mean, I was working on that in 2004, um, 2005, six, and, and so that was kind of my focus. I was looking at, at soldiers and, and how they kind of constructed racial constructions of Iraqi people, because the soldiers I was talking to were people that just occupied Iraq. Um, and then I got hired at a, at a, at a university uh, and I got hired with Judah, who we'd only met a few times before. And I started, to be honest, I was, I got hired in a kind of like a criminal, a critical, but still criminal justice program. And I was never a fan of police and wanted to be a police officer. Um, but I started, because I needed to kind of uh, 
feel like I fit in there. I started writing about police in order to kind because of, I was really kind of focused on the military and now I'm supposed to be a criminologist, right? And I, you know, and I had a master's in criminology, but my PhD was totally out of that. I went to the PhD program in order to get away from criminology. So what happened was basically I got hired with Judah and, and, you know, I had kind of a, I guess, a anti-police violence kind of sensibility. Um, and I was writing on police violence. Yeah. Before 2014, when Mike Brown was murdered. Um, but I think honestly, a lot, Judah helped kind of introduce me to, a much more coherent kind of abolitionist politics, right? Where I started kind of really articulating as a political project. And of course, then he turned me on to people that I guess I knew about, but not necessarily really, you know, engaged, you know, Ruthie Gilmore and, and, and whatnot in terms of really thinking about abolished critical resistance. Um, it's been really amazing um, uh, organization or group, you know, that's, that's really put ab help abolition on the map. Uh, today. So that's kind of how I came to it, right? It's kind of through study and scholarship, but then knowing that I needed to kind of have a more articulated kind of political take, you know, kind of understanding. Um, and, and so that's kind of how, yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't like I, you know, b born, b born an abolitionist and that was the main part of my life. You know, I, I came to it just, you know, a decade ago maybe. And, and, uh, you know, and then writing the book, uh, Police a field guide really then obviously that practice of writing really helped me kind of start I guess studying more seriously about it and 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 uh you know thinking thinking more about it so so yeah yeah great thanks thanks for answering that um in the midst of that we got another question here from Liberty and it looks like it's actually directed more towards Andrea um so Liberty says I'd love to hear more about upstate abolition projects. Uh, what do y'all do aside from set up great conversations like this one? Sure, and my co-founder um, co Maya Hislop is also on the call too, so she can, she can speak to this as well. Um, so Maya and I started upstate abolition project in the fall of 2019, um, actually in conversation with Julie, who is on this call too, I think, maybe. Um, and so when we had started, you know, we were really sort of focused on trying to do some prisoner support work and also just kind of do a little bit more political education in the upstate area around what abolition is, because it's not something that was necessarily readily on the tips of folks' tongues, you know. Um, but now um, that's changed a lot in the last like month and a half because we're in a radically different moment seemingly than we were previous to this. Um, and so um, one of the main areas that we're focusing our energy on now is actually working on a um, sort of broad defund campaign throughout the upstate region. So we've got folks that are coming from Greenville, Anderson and Spartanburg, and we've been meeting to try to work together to really think about how to strategically move toward defunding in the upstate. Um, and so that's sort of where, especially during the pandemic, you know, in the absence of being able to meet in person and do some of the activities that we had been doing prior to this, that's where we've been putting our energy. And Maya, if you can say more to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we really started out just wanting to figure out like who in the upstate was cool, you know, <laughs> <It was> like, <laughs> like get a sense of the, where are like our political allies hiding and how can we draw them out and just socialize and meet in a way that's like low key and not intense. Um, so we were writing letters to incarcerated folks and uh, specifically supporting political prisoners. But then when, you know, things like parchment or, or other kinds of um, prisoner movements were happening, we would sort of focus our energies there. And so it was actually a really cool way to, yeah, I think educate. I've been ed very much educated by Drea and um, my own work is more in sexual violence and literature. So I'm not all the way focused on policing necessarily, but I, I look at abolition in that context very specifically, um, which is also such a salient topic now because because of the Me Too movement, I feel like people are 
raising that all of the time. Like, well, what about rape? What about rapists when we went, when it comes to abolition? And so, um, it's useful to have both of our brains, <laughs> but yeah, I think, yeah, now there's all kinds of groups sprouting up in the, in the upstate. We have like a very new DSA and other groups are getting interested, even if they weren't before in things like defunding. So I think we're very excited by the opportunity just to coalition build. Um, that's like a big part of, of things. Sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. That also, um, at this point, the, the stack is open. If anyone has any, has any questions that they want to follow up with, either for about Upstate or, you know, more directed at Tyler and what we talked about in the discussion, the stack is open. Anything? <laughs> I guess I'm still unmuted. So I do have a question. <laughs> I was just gonna put it in the chat, but um, I have a lot of questions, but um, I keep like, anytime I sort of think about abolition, I think of the conversations that I have with my parents or, you know, older people who are, who are very on, at least my parents are sort of on the, reform side, reforms, it's just a few bad apples. Um, so I'm always thinking of like, well, what would they say? And this isn't exactly what they would say, but in your formulation, what I think is so interesting about this prerogative power formulation is you say prerogative power makes reform impossible because this is a power that was never meant to be accountable, right? It is an unaccountable power. So I think what some people might say is, okay, we just need to make them accountable, which I know, I understand like structurally that's the problem, like they can't be. But I wonder if, what I keep wondering is if like, okay, let's say Breonna Taylor's murders get, get thrown in jail and George Floyd's murders and all of the murders are somehow made accountable, does that, that doesn't undo what your formulation, right? It just makes, means that some exceptions have been made, right? Um, and certainly there are, there are examples of police being held accountable and maybe those have always just been exceptions. But I wonder if there's a, some space there because there, does this make sense? Sorry, I'm rambling, but like, yeah the way that people are thinking about it now is like so many of the slogans are around like they need to pay right these these specific cops like that would be just that would be justice and i wonder if i just wonder if that's more of an opening or a closure if accountability really matters in this formulation actually or if it's more about um pointing to the impossibility of accountability and and therefore pointing to the structural issues so. yeah yeah I mean, that's that's a great question maya i mean I, I mean i guess what i would say i mean you helped me kind of clarify what i was trying to get across earlier in in some of my comments which was it's not that individual police officers might not be held accountable at times right in fact they they are not not very much but they are but yeah i think it is trying to point to the the prerogative power as kind of a, a structural thing that leads us then to, to me, kind of the, the inevitable answer, which is abolition, uh, because it's so hard to hold uh, a power that was meant to be unaccountable accountable. But that, I think, one way to think about this, though, is what, what I, I think what I'm trying to say is that it's not that police can't be, their power can't be weakened and and dismantled or disbanded it's that we're not going to be able to have we're not going to be able to turn to the typical reforms like education and training and technology or even as you're saying throwing throwing individual officers in jail and that that is like a 
a, a hot topic right now, I think in some, in, in abolitionist circles, right? Does it legitimate the criminal justice system by calling for the, you know, uh, jailing of, of killer cops and this and that. And that's, that, that, that's a tough one, um, you know, but, but so you could think of defunding that like the defunding as not just the ultimate goal, but like a, a, a strategy, right? A tact or, a, you know, right. In order to lead us to a, a, a abolition that that is one way of trying to get, that's why, like, I think that's a really productive way, despite all the, like we were talking about the, you know, the, the, the uh, potential pitfalls of, you know, just directing funds to social workers that enact like cops, but defunding is a real important thing because it is challenging the police power in a substantial way. It's hitting them in the purse strings. It's hitting them in a way that does threaten their, that arrogant autonomy that I was talking about. Right. But, 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 uh, you know, education, Education and training and oversight boards and cha rechanging what you call policing to community policing and all of that does very little to actually change the structure of policing, but defunding would because it would significantly reduce the resources. And I think that gets into the, and again, I say this and uh, I, don't, I don't know if Judah will step in or Andrea, uh, but you know, the, the distinction that, that Ruthie Gilmore and other abolitionists made between reformist reforms and non-reformist reforms. You know, the reformist reforms are the, all the ones that I'm critiquing, you know, like abolitionists, my read, right? And I mean, aren't necessarily against reforms in terms of all reforms. It's, there's some reforms that actually reduce the reach and the capacity and the strength of the carceral system, you know? Um, and those are reforms, not those non-reformist reforms are the reforms that we need to get behind and push that's defunding and yeah firing cops and not letting them get uh uh you know paid paid administrative leave when they're being investigated and not letting them be rehired you know what you know uh, at other departments those are things that are productive i think that don't necessarily extend the life and the reach of the you know or the the the, the, the penal system or the police power um does that does that make sense you know what i mean like so it's not it's not just all reform. It's that, no, I, I think that the, the prerogative power of policing has to be challenged. We can't, it's not, I'm not making an, a nihilistic argument of like, oh shit, it can't be unaccountable. So let's not fight. Let's not chip away at it. No, I'm saying but why we, why I think we need to start from the idea that policing is a power that's never meant to be accountable is that it automatically pushes us into an abolitionist position because it, it says, well, shit, then I'm not going to be able to handle this power by these piecemeal reforms of community oversight, of more education, and more training, more technology. Because, you know, as, as, as abolitionists point out, more technology is giving the police more money. And the, the really crazy thing about police violence and reform is that, and many people have pointed this out, the, the quote, bad departments that are all of a sudden getting challenged because, you know, now people are realizing like, oh, shit, it's not just a matter of bad apples. There's a structural issue with this department they all get benefits usually from getting in trouble. <laughs> Meaning they get more training, more education, more technology, right? More money, more resources, which then just further entrenches the tyranny of police in the lives of everyday working people and not working people, right? And so to me, I don't know if that gets at your, at your question, but it's not it's not that individual police officers can't be held accountable. And that's, like I said, that's a debate that people can have and they are having. How do you do that? You know, do you fire them? Do you try to prosecute them, this and that? But I don't know if that is, is so, but that's not what I'm meaning necessarily. I am pointing to the structural power, right? Of, so, so one way I would say this is, you know, we can't like, if you take what I'm saying about prerogative power, seriously, we can't then turn to the law necessarily in order to like hold police accountable, you know? Because what we know is usually the law, I mean, my, my, the guy that I've mentioned before, Mark has said this before, but I love how he formulates this, almost always the law follows the police, meaning the law legitimates already existing police practice. And so, you, so if you take that seriously, it means we can't always be turning to the law and the Supreme Court and all of this to come in and kind of because one, like I said, they've refused to find, define what police is and discretion. They've shown a major reluctance to do that. But it also means like 
we can't be turning to the law to save us if we just accept the idea that policing itself, the law recognizes. This is where Mark talks about the permissive structure of the law, a phrase I like, the permissive structure of the law. It's supposed to be flexible. The law always comes in after the fact. So a great example is 1968 Terry versus Ohio, the stop and frisk case. You know, that's what we always cite. It wasn't like police officers just started stopping and frisking people then. They had always been doing that, right? But then finally it was adjudicated and the courts came in and said, oh shit, let's consider if this is constitutional or not. And what do we find? By and large, the police or the law gives some type of sanction on some level, gives some type of parameters while always leaving in the loophole of but and accept, right? Well, you can't do this except for if you find uh, the, this, the public safety, right? And, that, and who does that, who determines that? The discretionary prerogative of the individual cop that gets to always say, well, I was acting reasonably. I saw this, I smelled this, he did this, I did that. Who does the courts almost always side with? Them, right? So it's a structural issue about how it kind of, it's also that where I was saying earlier that you can't conflate police and law because you think about police killings, the courts might come in and say, you know, hey, Mr. Officer, you were unconstitutional. You, you, you know, you killed this person uh, unconstitutionally. But the law already gave them, that permissive structure of the law already gave the police the power to kill in the first place. The courts only come in after the fact, right? And so to me, that presents this issue of like, we can't be turning necessarily, because of those structural dynamics that we're talking about, turn to the law as somehow, you know, and, and I would say, I guess, if the law, the majesty of the law won't necessarily hold police accountable. It makes all these other types of, uh, you know, uh, maneuvers like civilian review boards or whatnot. It's like, you know, if the law won't hold you accountable, are we really going to be able to create some type of like civilian review board? Police always resist their, resist that. And I'm not saying we don't struggle. I mean, that's what's happening. That's what's so fascinating about, you know, you know the question Andrea asked about this current moment is it seems like we're at a really interesting moment where people are like, no, 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 <laughs> or, you know, we're, we're going to do this. And, and that's where I think defunding and abolition makes sense because it is trying, I mean, defunding is, I think, trying to get at, it, it recognizes, right, that policing is a power that we've not been able to be successful holding accountable in all these other ways. So, you know what, we're going, we're going to the money. You know, and that's, that's not necessarily new. I mean, it's new, but it's like that was developing four or five years ago around Black Lives Matter. You started seeing that in Chicago popping up, you know, where they were asking people on subways to hold up signs that would say, what do you, you know, what would you spend your money on <laughs> if you had all this money that the police department has, right? And that was a way of getting right at the question, I think, of prerogative power in a way, right? Saying we can't hold it accountable in any other way. So what do we do? We try to reduce its resources as best we possibly can. Right, that's the way you address kind of that that structural component. Maybe I don't know. I'm just I'm just riffing, thinking, thinking out loud. Well, yeah, that was that was a really great answer to a really great question. Um, I feel like comes up for a lot of folks. So thanks for answering that. So I do know that we're we're coming up on about ninety minutes here. Um, so it looks like there's two more questions in the chat that are pretty related to one another. So maybe after that question, we can move towards wrapping up for the night. Does that sound, does that sound good? Great. That's cool. So the last two questions here um, have to do with the, militariz the militarization of the police. Um, Bill wanted to ask what role you feel that the militarization of police plays in the current police crisis or in policing in general? Um, and then Jim followed up with some questions and sort of like uh, added comments about um, feminism and the role of sort of uh, patriarchy or toxic masculinity uh, within police forces as they are uh, currently sort of uh, organized and perhaps some of the services or alternatives that might exist and um, the degree to which those like, uh, you know, I'm not sure exactly. I could probably 
if you want to take the first part of that question, I could also un unmute Jim's microphone um, to let them expand on that question a little bit. But do you want to kick off with just that question about the militarization of the police? Yeah, I mean, this I think is, you know, I mean, I think it's an important question in terms of thinking about um, how we think about police, police power as a prerogative power and how we are able to articulate critiques of police in ways that sometimes shore up the legitimacy of police. That's the way I kind of think about militarization. Like, let me be very clear. There is a, there is a process that we could call militarization that's very real, right, in terms of a, a tracking back and forth of language and aesthetics and technology and weapons between military and policing. Um, but I think there exists a discourse around the militarization of police, and I've thought about this for a while, that, that really kind of absolves policing as the violent institution that it is. It almost, the discourse implies that if you take the military out of the police, then somehow, um, you know, the policing is like this noble institution. Like the militarization discourse, I see it as often a corrupting discourse. Like it, the idea is that there's a corruption of what is already a noble, good, democratic police force, right? And it's not a coincidence that a lot of libertarian, right libertarians are, are, are the ones promoting this. Not, not all, but a, a lot, right? In fact, I see some on the left and the libertarians joining forces, or not joining forces, but joining discourses in the language of militarization, right? Um, and, and then that raises the question of like, what counts as militarization? Often it's the big, you know, jackbooted officer, but no, like I study the police dog, one of the things that I've written on, like you rarely hear the police dog mentioned as a form of militarization. It's always the SWAT team, the assault rifle, the helmet, the shield, the boots, the, the bear cat or the Hummer, all of that. But no one talks about the police dog as like a militarization. Uh, Meaning the distinction itself doesn't hold up because policing and military have always kind of been linked in a way because it, they both grow out of colonial history in, in, in the U.S., right? And so that the colonial uh, uh, relationship automatically kind of blurs that, right? I, I, on that, I always quote Fanon in Wretched of the Earth where he, he, he often always mentions police and soldiers in the same line. And that's not a coincidence, right? Because they're, they're linked. They're fundamentally, there's a unity there. And so I think the militarization discourse, like I said, there is something we can track empirically as a militarization that's harmful. But the way in which we critique the police, I don't think it is necessarily the most, I actually think it's more harmful than it is, than, than it is good. I don't think we need it. So one way to think, we have, militarization provides us with a language of critiquing some police, the jackbooted you know, SWAT team officer, but we don't have much of a, a language to critique the, the cop that's trying to read you know, books to my kid at school, you know, like we might get upset or, you know, middle-class sensibilities might be violated if we see the SWAT team come in, maybe or maybe not, to read books to our children. But if it's officer-friendly coming in, then all of a sudden it's like, oh, that's the good police that we want to be talking to our kids. But it's like, no, but, you know, and the, and the other point here is, look, it's, to my knowledge, it's a fact, I, I you know, the majority of people being killed by police are not being killed by SWAT teams or military issued assault rifles. They're being killed, as we saw in Minneapolis, by a knee, as we saw in Ferguson with a standard issue handgun. Um, you know, like it's it's that officer friendly that you see drinking coffee at you know at, you know at the Seven Eleven is 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 is. is a, a threat to people's safety, not necessarily just the SWAT team, as bad as the SWAT team is, right? I mean, obviously, I'm, you know, let's, let's get rid of them too. Um, but, but, uh, but yeah, I, I think, I think it's an, it, it's an issue um, in terms of how it kind of dominates the discourse. I think it's actually, I mean, acad I mean I'm, I'm an academic. I, I do think you've seen over the last, I mean, some of them are my friends too, but you've seen over the last, I think, six, seven years, a real growing a discourse that's critiquing the militarization angle. I mean, it's becoming now um, uh, much more common, right? People are kind of seeing, seeing, realizing that there's more, there's more to a critique of police than simply pointing out the the the, the militarization, the militarized components of it. Um, but yeah, I, I think of it as like an inoculation. It's a turn, you know. It's like 
so you admit a little bit of bad, right? Like, oh, the jackbooted police officer in order to kind of save the entire institution, right? You admit a little bit of bad, and I'm taking that from bars and, and mythologies, but you know, that's inoculation. Admit a little bit of bad to hide a, little, a lot of evil, right? And that's kind of the way he formulates it. But I, but I always think about that in terms of how we often critique police, right? So the bad apple is kind of a similar way, the militarization, they kind of operate on the same thing. I don't know if they ever want to really get at that structural power of police. Mm. It's not a coincidence too. What, and one last point and then I'll be quiet. That let's say, and others have pointed this out, but community policing grew up with what we now think of as the militarization of policing. Like they grew up as twin projects, right? Mm. And again, we often, many, many discourses on militarization don't really take into account that community policing is itself a product of militarized policing. It's a pacification campaign. It grows out of the history of Vietnam. Christian Williams, the great anarchist writer, who wrote Our, Our Enemies in Blue, another great book, he points this out in an argument or in, in an article from years ago, right? Like, you know, community policing grew out of as a pacification strategy, kind of, right? It was a way to win hearts and minds. That's the coffee with the cop. It was the way to say our legitimacy is being broken and sometimes our violence hurts our legitimacy as we're learning in this moment again. And so we now have to look better. We have to now say that we're going to be more peaceful, more democratic. We're gonna to listen to people. We're not gonna see them as enemies, but nevertheless, it's built upon a certain kind of um, project of trying to, to, again, create people's trust and faith in police, that's what community policing is. It, it, it still sees the problem as us, as people that don't accept what I, I call the police definition of reality, right? The people that kind of just refuse to believe what the police are telling them, that's what community policing kind of does, right? But it is important to the militarization point. They grew up historically together. <laughs> like, so on one hand, right, you have community policing in this discourse of like, well, we're the opposite of militarization. The community policing is gonna be different because we recognize the faults and the problems of militarization, but they grew up together, right? Like they grew up together in LA, right? When they were being, you know, like when the SWAT team is being formed, there's all, there's concerns about, well, shit, how do we get the black community to like us more, you know, to, 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 to convince them that we're actually their friends. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's like that, but we often don't think of community policing as itself a form of militarization. So, so I find the, fra the framework to be quite limited. Yeah, and it sounds like Jim had sort of like an added component to discuss there with the militarization. Jim, did you want to follow up with that? Oh, sure, if there's time. Sure, uh, yeah. Okay. So this comes out of a conversation I had in, in Columbia. Um, I was lobbying some lawmakers on sentence reduction. And um, one of the lawmakers uh, said to me, well, I think we actually need to get tougher on crime. And I said, but by the time you're dealing with sentencing, you're not tough on crime, you're, you're weak on crime, you're allowing crime to occur, um, and you're not investing in the things. If you were tough on crime, you'd be investing in these other things. Um, and these other things would be more counseling services, uh, more, you know, better teacher, you know, pay for teachers, uh, and you'd be doing more training with teachers. And I'm and it was this thought that I had as I walked out into the hallway afterwards that these things that I was talking about tend to be professions or careers that we tend to assign uh, to as careers for women uh, and that they're, they're feminized, if you will, at least in, in the minds, at least of lawmakers in Columbia, South Carolina. And I'm just wondering if if that's part of, if, if this is really a sort of, I know we think about it as a race problem, is it, is it really a, a sort of a, a feminism type of issue or a patriarchy issue um, that we're confronting with that's manifests itself as a, a racial conflict as well? Um, because we devalue these professions that we really need to be bolstering uh, but maybe that's just, you know, like I said, this thought just hit me as I walked down the hallway as, you know, gee, I should have hit that thought with the, the lawmaker. Um, and I don't know if there's any validity to that. I wonder if people have given some deeper thought to that than I have. You can mute me. 
I mean, I, I guess I'll jump in here, but I'll, I'll try to be brief because I'd love to hear other people. And I know he, you mentioned Maya in your chat. Maybe she could answer this, but but I, I'm thinking of like Alex Vitale's where, I mean, it doesn't get it directly at it, but one of the things that he's, he's arguing, right, in into policing is that what we've seen since the 1970s is the police, and I think this relates to issues of patriarchy and masculinity, has really taken on this really robust role in our life. You know, the police have always been there. There's something about kind of the upstart and neoliberalism in the, in the 70s, and then, of course, the war on crime and all of that, where we do, where there has been established this kind of, this, um, where the police project or the carceral state has been one of the key ways to handle social problems, right? And of course, that is a very, very masculinist project, you know? And so, so we, you know, and that this relates to questions of defunding now, because now you have, uh, you know, the police taking up all kinds of city budgets and all these other professions that you're talking about that, you know, are not necessarily getting, say, the funding that they, that, that, you know, that they, they need to, to do a, a decent job or whatnot. So I, but, but I think that gets at it in a broad way. I mean, I do think policing is a patriarchal power fundamentally, um, but, but yeah, there's something there about what's happened since the 1970s and 80s where the police have taken on uh, this, not just a role, but even in the cultural kind of consciousness, that that's how you help people, that that's the primary way in which you help people. I know this from students, you know, they come to, there's, there's been a few students, some of my better um, successes, I guess, in the master's program I used to teach in, where they would, you know, they got their bachelor's degree in like criminal justice or something, criminology, and they go through the master's program, and then all of a sudden they're taking these a little bit more advanced classes, um, and, and then the majority are not this way, but I've had like two or three uh, in my six years at this place that came to me and doing, oh my gosh, I, I'm having like a crisis of, uh, of faith, you know, like I always thought I was going to be a career police officer and now I don't. And what they would say, all, they all said this was, I always wanted to help people, but now I don't know what to do because I've, you know, I've studied and I, I realize, you know, I, I'm having some moral questions about being a police officer. Or and I always ask them, like, why do you think that being a police officer is actually helping you know, like, why about being a school teacher, a nurse, uh, you know, even, you know, a social, you know, but the point is like their idea of what helping is, is through the police. And I think we have to contend with that. And I, to me, that's kind of what one of your, your questions is kind of getting at in a sense, right? Where the police take on this dominant role in society to where it starts to even influence the way that we think and how we imagine what helping means. And that, that has material. I mean, we see that, that, that connects to the material issue, right? Which is, city budgets are going to that too. <laughs> That's where the, I mean, you know this, I, I mean, cr criminal justice jobs, they're, they're out there <laughs> because those are the jobs that the state's funding or, you know, that local governments are funding. Um, I don't know if that gets at it, but I mean, I think there's a, there, the, but there is a, that is a, uh, a gender question. I, a fun, I do think fundamentally. Um, yeah. Anyone else on that? I did. I think that's such a great question too. I, I'll try to be really fast, but one of the things I was thinking about, Tyler, when you were talking about, you know, the social, if we just put all, all the police budget money into social workers, they are also an arm of the state and they enact other kinds of violences. So the gendering, as much as it's like, um, yes, the, these, these kinds of work, this kind of work gets a lack of respect. And so if it got more respect, potentially it could be of more help. Sometimes empowering those same arms of the state can just reenact other kinds of violence. So for example, you know, social ser uh, child care services in black communities, just overwhelmingly, you know, acts in, in ways that are demonizing of black mothers and treats black families as these things to basically just manipulate and, and shuffle around in whatever way that they want and make all kinds of racist assumptions about those family structures that are problematic. So there's that. Um, but I was also thinking when you said that, Tyler, of like, I mean, right now the, the, the slogan is so heightened to like, well, can we at least just stop killing black people? Right? Like, okay, 
like we're not even at the point it feels so early on in the stage of of, of helping does that make sense <laughs> the helping that we can't even get to the point of like okay okay social services okay okay like these things would probably be bad too but like we're not even at a point of like respecting life so can we can we do that for you know what i mean like i, I just as soon as you said that about about social social work i was like well at least black people maybe wouldn't be dying at, at the same rate maybe right we we don't you're right to say we don't actually know that for sure but maybe is better than never um just sort of my thinking yeah yeah well, all right yeah. seems like uh as good a spot as any to maybe yeah. start wrapping up um thanks everyone so much for coming out to this event tonight uh, and for this really robust discussion that uh, grew out of the initial discussion between Andrea and Tyler. Um, really, really want to send a thanks and appreciation to Upstate Abolition Projects for making this event happen. Um, Andrea reached out to us maybe just a couple weeks ago, uh, connected us with Tyler um, and Maya here as well. Uh, it has been you know, really great. Um, I, Andrea, do you have anything that you wanted to share about anything that's coming up for um, Upstate Abolition Project or anything like that? Um, I would encourage folks to check out um, our Facebook and Instagram pages. We're, you know, we're continuing to do this work around defunding in the Upstate. Um, we meet weekly, um, and so you're welcome to either contact us directly through either of those platforms, or um, you can also check out our website, which is Upstate Abolition Project at WordPress, some configuration. Um, if you Google it, it will come. Um, but um, yeah, so we're continuing the defund work and um, also going to be trying to kick up some abolitionist study here in the Upstate. Um, so if folks want to get involved in that, we would welcome everyone who would like to join us. And thank you so much to Firestorm for making this possible. This was such a great event. We really appreciate it. Yeah, I, I, I would like to thank obviously Andrea and Maya and 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 Firestorm. It's been it's been fun. Ho hopefully, it wasn't so. Uh, I'm not a big fan of Zoom um, and being recorded, but um, you know, ho hopefully, it was worthwhile and wasn't so painful. Um, so, so yeah, I appreciate, I appreciate all the good questions and for, for the chance to kind of, you know, get, get, get a chance to ramble for, for a little while. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Well, yes, yeah, so we very much appreciate your rambling as well, Tyler. It's very <laughs> um, The book's more coherent. Awesome. Yes, the book, the book. I just dropped the link uh, to the book in the chat there. Um, folks could click there to buy it from Firestorm. We are shipping all over the country uh, amidst the pandemic here. Um, so you can find out more there. And thank you again for coming out tonight. This was a really wonderful event, very informative. Thanks so much for being here. Great. Thanks all.